creativity is by definition creating something out of nothing. If you're an artist, you learn that the thing that you think you're creating is not the thing that you end up creating. The idea of failure in some ways is saying, I had an idea of what I thought needed to happen or what should happen and it turned out differently. It's actually not failure at all. This is what art does. Art gets to the soul, gets to the the place where values, where relationships, where meaning is made. It's change, evolve, grow, stretch. In this episode, we're going to explore the inner work that we do, the practices that we have, the tools that we use that help us weather the storms, that help us deal with the challenging times, and actually fortify us for the supreme ordeal, that ultimate challenge that every hero and every creative inevitably encounters. All right, we are entering a culminating point for the hero's journey. Classically, it's called the Supreme Ordeal. And I wanted to open up by asking kind of what it means, how we've navigated it, what we've experienced it like in our lives, and um, how have we made these extreme trials fruitful? Mm. So, and you know, I might even say, yeah. since you asked me right at the beginning, well, I don't know if you've gone through it, Matthew. Mm. Yeah, well, uh, I, you know, I wouldn't want to make that assumption. Yeah, sure. To characterize uh, and, and it's a good question because as soon as you brought it up, I thought, well, I feel like I have. I mean, right. certainly the last few, you know, the last few years have really put me through the ringer. And in some ways, I wonder if I have, or I'm nervous that maybe I haven't. <laughs> <laughs> You'll know it when you see it. Well, maybe, <laughs> but. But this, but this really challenging period of my life yeah. that, I'm, that I came out of over the last few years, uh, I actually found a way to appreciate it, to really appreciate it, even in the moment. You know, my meditative practice is actually what got me through this period from losing my job, almost losing my house, losing my mother, and the end of my marriage, and a very challenging divorce. Yeah, that's pretty ordeal-like. I wondered about that because I, I, I approached it without, even, even while it was happening, there were certain tools that I employed that makes me look back and wonder, was that really? But I bring it, I, I'm, I'm saying that only because you coming out of a, a, a supreme ordeal. Yeah. For sure. I, for sure. Yeah. But I think there's a perspective that you have now recognizing that as supreme, whereas even in other times, there are these mini cycles that yeah. we go through. Yeah. And I'm, yeah, yeah, I, I want to sure. just bring that up because there are going to be a lot of people who are listening to this who might be 25, yeah. who might be 30, who might be 40, who might yeah. be 60. Yeah. And a 60 year old might be chuckling at us saying, Oh, you just <laughs> you wait. Wait. <laughs> yeah. wait. You think that was a supreme ordeal, right? <laughs> yeah. But I, uh, uh, but I say that because I think we'll also sometimes there's a, a, a microcosm that's a, a year where we can even go through a hero's journey within a year yeah. and a decade. Right. Or a For lifetime sure. up to out to this point. So I just want so to. I think the, um, yeah, the maybe the characteristic that we're looking for is the supreme part, <laughs> right? So there's lots of ordeals, but every once in a while, there's one that um, is life changing, and motive changing, and character changing, and it's so thorough that it stamps us. It stamps us with a certain kind of handprint. It leaves its traces, unlike other things that we suffer and go through. But these supreme things, uh, they have an order of magnitude to them. So I was just thinking about Star Wars on the way here after dinner. I was thinking about, you know, the original Star Wars trilogy. We saw Luke uh, go through his ordeal. We face Darth Vader, lose his hand. Mm. And, and after that, you know, things are easier. Like... You know, Return of the Jedi is like, oh, we have to destroy the Death Star again. But it's it's not like what he went through. However, what we get to see in the new Star Wars sagas is that he's not done with his initiation, with his training. He goes through another supreme ordeal in training the new Jedi and having one turn on him. And, and then he goes out to um, the island... And he has to face himself yet again and master himself yet again, which I found quite profound. Mm. This journey of constant humbling mm. and constant spiritual growth to the point where he can appear uh, in front of Kylo Ren and do battle and he's not even there. He's absolute master. 
And it's not about him. He is not about him. He, he makes it there. And that is when he's able to transcend to the next dimension. Now, I don't know how the writers wrote it, but that's how I, mm. I read it. It's profound. Mm. Yeah. It's totally and there's, a, there's a similar profundity with, with all great stories that the hero goes through these things and they are changed as a person. They come out a new person. So what I'd like to talk about in this episode is what have we, what have we experienced, like revealed for, for each other and for our audience just a window into your life about what we've experienced, what you've experienced, uh, and how have you made it fruitful when you're going through that soul-crushing, all-encompassing moment of hell? Mm. It's a, it's great, and actually, I would love to now perhaps take this moment to talk about what we're just talking about our our processes and actually some uh, some tips or whatever that we've gone through that has actually been very useful f- for us, our own practices. And something we can offer our listeners as, oh, something that I can take or a place where I can go mm-hmm. to begin to actually take the, the stories that I'm hearing from Louisa and Matthew and Jeff and, and actually see, okay, so what can I actually apply uh, in my own life? We have to find our ways through these, through these mires because um, they're absolutely unendurable without some... Without something. Without something. Mm-hmm. Right. And so, so, um, in what we're saying, if you're experiencing this as a listener, or if you've been through this, and, um, you, you know, you, we identify with you if you've, if you've found your way of coping that's maybe not quite your best self or your, or your <laughs> highest and best use, or you're, you know, you're maybe ashamed of some of these habits that you pick up to cope with life and, and all these hardships. But we've done that too. So there's, so there's no judgment or anything like that. It was just like trying to get a grip on, on um, okay, if we're surfing this chaos, how is it done? Right. What have we learned? Yeah. And we even have to say that, you know, if you read Parsifal, which is a, this grand hero's journey, remember, right in the middle of it, he checks out and says, this is too much for me. I'm out of here, guys. And in Wolfram von Eschenbach's book, it's te- I think it's a 10-year period yeah. that yeah. he covers in a chapter, or if right. even that much. It's like he went off for 10 years and now he comes back. Right. There was 10 years where yeah. he was saying... I am done with my hero's journey. I'm checking out. You know, <laughs> this has been way too much. And he's like, oh, I, I have to. So I think the, um, okay. Odysseus yeah. did that on the island with Cicero too. Right, seven years. Mm-hmm. Spent, you know, yeah, with so, her. And, so absolutely, there's no yeah. judgment. That can, be, yeah. be, that can actually be part of the journey. That's absolutely. okay. And yeah. some folks, we have to recognize that sometimes that is too much. And it also, sometimes also saying, you know what, I need to find a job or I need to quit my job and go yeah. do these Zen retreats can actually be what you need. Yeah. That can yeah. actually That's be part of your journey. Yes, yes. yes. Yeah. yeah. So, nonetheless, coming back to it, when we do go through whatever we're going through or whatever anybody you're going through who's watching or listening is what are some of the rhythms and the practices that, that we can share See, the, the challenge in that question, though, Matthew, is there are so many. There are so many. Because uh, I don't know about you, but I'm almost certain, actually, I do know about you, <laughs> that these ordeals, there are many ordeals, and, they're, and, they're, and they're, they're almost rhythmic, right? And they, they, they come back again and again because they're the high octave kind of thing. They're the same thing, but at a different level, like you've, you've right? Um, and the supreme ordeal... Maybe that happens once, maybe it happens twice or more often in your life. I don't know. Everybody's different. But every time, it's a new set of, it's a new thing. And it's your own medicine that you're crafting for your own healing. Um, so the, the, for me, mm. when it comes to, well, what are the practices and tools you use? Uh, it really depends on the situation. <clears throat> Why don't we just reveal some of the guide? the guidelines and the compass points that we've used to get through our supreme ordeals in our life. I, I've been through what I would consider two. Mm-hmm. Um, and I certainly have learned and adopted like a few guiding ideas that really work. Okay. Well, for example, um, in the end of the last episode, we hinted at the connection between what we experience and our agency in that experience that we're not victims okay even when we are victims of of crimes of trauma 
there's a part of us that is witnessing that, that is awake, and that helps us reintegrate those experiences later. Mm -hmm. So we're not always helpless bystanders. We are active participants in what we endure. Mm -hmm. So Novalis, for example, said, whatever happens, I intend. What he meant was, on a higher level, at some spiritual level, I'm there with me. I put myself in this body, in this life, in these trials. Now, that's a challenging idea. If we've experienced really horrible, traumatic things, why would I ever do that to myself intentionally? But on the other hand, I have found <clears throat> some wisdom and some guidance in that. Mihal used to call it brick theory. So if we're walking down the street and a brick falls on our head, we have to imagine that it was we ourselves who walked ahead of us, pushed the brick off the wall, and bonked ourselves on the head. What am I, what am I teaching myself by going through this? Now, it may be a bit of an abstract question at first, but for me in my life, it has given me back my agency when I have felt powerless, or given me a sense of this is not all meaningless. There is a part of me here that's going through this experience willingly even if it's horrific and brutal, that I am here experiencing it. So when David Lynch talked about the failure of Dune, he said, you know, he was just absolutely crushed, but it was so beautiful down there. And when I've been at my absolute lowest, I have found moments of uh, being so bottomed out and so destroyed that to look at a flower or an acorn or, or my children or the stars or simple, simple rippling of water, I'm reminded that there is wisdom and beauty and, and, and truth pulsing in the world and that at some level I'm part of that. And in that space of being absolutely crushed, I can then ask, okay, I can think, I can be quiet and listen. Um, who here in, in myself is not crushed? Who here is awake to these stars or this acorn or... This flower, who here is awake to my beautiful child? And there's part of me that is just watching. And Carl Jung called that the witness. There's part of me that's there thinking, I'm okay. I'm still here. I can integrate this. I can move out of this. This too shall pass. All of this is temporary. Mm -hmm. um, and that has saved me from suicidal thoughts. That has saved me from self-destructive thoughts and recklessness and um, you know pulled me back from making decisions I would regret so so having that bigger context um, that idea that wait a minute there's, there's even though this is absolutely terrible there is another octave or a circle out you know ring out and I need to get to see this from another point of view so that I can not only endure it but make sense of it in time. So that has been a really, like a really, I would say, central uh, guiding idea for me in my life. But I'd like to posit, though, that that even though that has been, that that is a uh, that is a muscle that has been built. And let me give you. I'll go mm -hmm. back and give you an example mm -hmm. of some of my meditative practice and some of the work that I have done because I, you know, I I have a similar experience. Um, you know, the sort of the beginning of this uh, phase in my life where I would say I went through a supreme ordeal. I had lost a job. Um, I, so I had no work. I was already running on a mega deficit. I had, I had debt. I owned a home. Um, and I remember pulling in one day after just carrying for a while the stress and thinking, wait, I'm 34, 35, something like that. Why do I feel like somehow... I deserve to have a home or I deserve to own a house. Like a lot of people don't own a house, right? So there was this kind of, okay, I can, I can relax into that. Maybe I'll lose it. That's fine. Right. And there'll be another piece of the adventure, right? And to grab the opportunity to then begin writing, writing a screenplay and taking my four daughters on a backpacking trip to the top of Mount Whitney. And, you know, and what was that that actually allowed me to take that moment and then with, like I said, with my mother passing away and, and then the marriage really becoming clear that it was not going to last, that was a lot of stuff. And it wasn't just because I had ideas that I believed in. I think there was a practice 
that had gone through. And that was an inner practice. Because once again, it's not even how we tackle that, how, that issue. To me, I know that what brought me there was reviewing my day backwards at night before I go to bed, mm. for example. Mm -hmm. uh, my relentless journaling uh, before I go to bed, you know, actually writing down some of the, the thoughts that I had um, in a place where I could write them and not discount the thoughts. Because in a journal, I could, if I'm having a conflict with you and I, my, my, uh, my natural way to go is maybe I'll defer or, you know what, it's not as important to me. I can, I can let this, I can let this go. Right. Mm -hmm. But privately in my journal, I can talk about all my frustrations mm -hmm. when maybe if I see you on the, okay, breathe and we're just going to move on. But that mm -hmm. doesn't actually heal that. Mm -hmm. Right. But sometimes being able to write about it and actually coming to understand my needs. Mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. So the place of getting to that moment, I don't think was even the thought process of pulling up into my driveway and saying, yeah, it's great to have a house, but most 34 year olds in the world don't own a, don't own a house. So why should I? Mm. Yeah. Uh, this kind of letting, this letting go of the attachments. That's great. But that was a process of getting there because there right. will be some people who say, good for you. I couldn't get there. Right, right, right? right. Good for you for whatever, but I couldn't do it. And I sometimes I'll hear that and I'll say, wait, that, like, maybe you can't now. But if it's something, and it, 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 it strikes me even more when it's, I wish I could do that, but I could never do that. Oh, and that's right. the one that always kind of strikes me. Well, no, actually, you can't do that now, but there are actually processes that you can go through. There's rhythm. And last night I wrote something down. It was uh, patience. Or practice patience and perseverance mm -hmm. right and I would say that's probably something that mm -hmm. when you get to the, the, the these challenging moments it's the fact that since you were 20 something you've been meditating mm -hmm. right but that would you agree that that's something that allows you to deal with the challenges yeah I mean meditation is a is the foundation upon it all for the because it, it, it slowly, over time, helps build some structure in your soul. And it's a difference between having a scaffolding but no house. So something is holding something up so you, um, and then having the house itself. So the scaffolding um, at first holds things up, but then you have to just get rid of the scaffolding and you have to have a house. So meditation is kind of like that. You're building, we call it building the hut. And it's a place, the hut is a place where you can go, where you can find peace and equanimity that you have stored in there. And you and the reason why it's there is because you're meditating every day and every, every day, just for a little bit, you're putting a little bit of peace into that hut. So when the dramas happen, you've got a place where you can go so that you are not, so that you can weather the storms of life. So that's kind of, so Dennis, our teacher, called it building the hut. So meditation is, um, it's building the hut as a, this is just a, an analog really, but what it's doing is it's building these muscles in your soul. It's building capability in your soul. It's not going to happen overnight. Um, there are lots of different meditations that you can do. That have specific purposes. So, um, for a long, I went through um, a time uh, three years ago, I think now, two to three years ago, where Jeff and I went through a tremendous amount of uh, financial uncertainty. Um, it's so interesting because we're, in a way, you could say that back then we were in a better financial situation than maybe we are now, if you were to compare them. But then I was much more afraid. Now I'm not really afraid anymore. But then I had to uh, manage my fear because it was a constant, it was a constant presence in my life was this gnawing, biting fear, fear of, you know, of, uh, because I, because of lack of safety that financial security creates. And for some reason I was particularly triggered about fear. And so my meditations, um, were really about deliberately setting up just for a couple of minutes every day a time and a space 
in which I could give myself permission to not be afraid. I could come back to it when I was done. It's fine. But for that time where I was doing my concentration exercise, my concentration, I was concentrating on peace and I was concentrating on uh, letting the fear go. And I could do it because it was only for a couple of minutes because I was really born into my fear. Um, but it was a very specific, it was a concentration. So I was, um, I was concentrating on counting from 30 to zero backwards. And I had to only think about the numbers. I couldn't think about anything else. It's really difficult to do. <laughs> um, I was also working with a button where I was, um, uh, trying to produce the image of the button that I had in my mind, um, as completely as I could, um, so different, and there are others as well, where you're just focusing on one thing. But in order to get there, you have to kind of, I had to notice, okay, what's, where's the fear, where's the stress throughout my body, and just let it go. I'm noticing you, and now I'm letting you go. I'm noticing you, thank you for sharing, please sit down. Okay, I'm noticing you there. So was, I had to sort of like do this clearing, and then I could do the concentration exercise, because otherwise my mind was just doing, too busy. So, um, so you would do the concentration exercise, yeah. and then you would sink into your peace meditation, which was very simple, just yeah, it was being just, peaceful. Okay, so then it was about um, having a say in what I was feeling. So often our feelings are, they just take over, and we have no control over what we feel until they subside, and then we're like, okay, now I'm back in control again, but... Um, but this is a this is a little momentary intervention every day into your feeling life. The first one was more in the thinking life and the thoughts that you're thinking. But this is feeling life, which is um, to deliberately call up in your soul a feeling of peace. And I had to go through this uh, clearing exercise of, you know, the, uh, in order to be able to create this feeling of peace. It was not easy to do because I I wanted to go into the feeling of fear. Um, or stress uh, is very attractive to go there and wallow in all this fear because I've got all these good reasons for why I should be afraid. So, but instead, it was okay. Just for this time, I'm going to really try to feel peace. And I had to, I had little you know ways of doing that. Cause it's not easy to do. It was like okay, just imagine a scene on a picture or rem have a memory of when I was at peace and you know recall that uh, memory. That kind of thing, but I had to feel it. That was the purpose, and I would. I may not have always been successful, but the key with meditation is not that you're successful, but that you try. No one is ever good in the beginning of a practice. You only get good with a lot of practice. So anyway. So how long did you? How long did did you do that? Was that how long was that your your meditative practice? That specific stuff. While I was dealing with fear. So my meditative practice looks different now than it did then um, because I really needed to have a way to manage the uncontrollable fear. Otherwise, I mean, I don't know what would have happened. If I, I mean, I just, that, those little meditations, they saved my ass. I could not have survived that period of our, of our life because we're entrepreneurs, Jeff and I. And we have taken lots of risks. We are self-funding our own company. And we and we have so far chosen not to go for investment, for instance, because we want to have full control of the company. And the personal financial risk and, and raising children whom you, you know, you're responsible for. Um, it's it's uh, the, just the, the, the risk that it felt like to do it. And, and I could not have survived that as an entrepreneur. I think any entrepreneur who's listening to this is probably going to be like, oh, I feel you, you know. <laughs> um, it's just incredibly difficult to live with the risk that, that real entrepreneurship requires if you don't have a practice like that. I think the ideas and the practices go hand in hand. And like an idea like brick theory, what I just mentioned 10 mm -hmm. minutes ago, um, even the idea that I'm not going to kill myself, you know, I'm not going to check out. I, I'm going to have to find another way of looking at this situation. Mm -hmm. 
I'm going to have to find another perspective. So when you write it down and describe it, it might seem like an intellectual exercise, but it's an idea that allows you to shift perspective. And shifting perspective can free up what is otherwise a stuck system, a stuck person. So for me, yeah, the practices are crucial. Journaling, meditating, making art, these things that we do, that I do. Um, but the shift in worldview, the shift in ideas, the shift in thinking is, is completely crucial so that one doesn't simply repeat the thoughts that keep you stuck. You have to have others tell you other ways of looking at things. And then you think, wow, that opens up new possibilities and new channels. That's why we study wisdom literature and wisdom teachings is so that those ideas can sort of sit with us and work on us. And so uh, another key practice for us is study. We have all these books and we have more books in the back. Um, we study not only the technical parts of our craft or of our many business aspects of marketing and strategy or art making, but we also study uh, spiritual literature from various backgrounds, especially anthroposophy. Um, Every day. And that is just like part of the rhythm. And we have learned that an hour of meditating and study in the morning um, gives us a bunch of energy and nourishment for the whole day. Mm -hmm. um, so there's other practices too, limiting our time on the screen, making sure that we're getting outside. For me, big part of it is physical work, um, being in the studio, making artwork. Uh, I have noticed over the years that there is an optimum, just like there's, I have an optimum diet, I have an optimum kind of set of activities that I do. Time diet almost? Yeah, well, mm -hmm. it's not like a regimen, but I know if I'm not in my studio, Every it's, day. It, starts to, it starts to wear on me, you know? Can't always be in the studio every day. But if I'm on the screen all the time for days and days, I start to slip inwardly. Um, so, so watching screen time, being um, physical, uh, making physical things in my studio, these are kind of like consciousness care things that, that I do in addition to meditation and study. Mm -hmm. Now, that doesn't lessen the supreme ordeal. I think in my life, the supreme ordeal has been brought on as a kind of almost organic process, like the cocoon turning into a butterfly. Like it was inevitable. It was coming and it was like, get ready. You know, the ground is shaking and trembling. But those practices and disciplines... Um, certainly make it, number one, survivable, and number two, I think, fruitful, because every night one is, is, is sleeping with a kind of openness to learn, what is in this for me? What do I need to learn? What do I need to wake up with in the morning to see one little tiny little piece of this puzzle, right? And after days and weeks and months, and in our case, years of that, um, the puzzle starts to make sense. Pictures start to emerge. The nighttime becomes really fruitful. And this rhythm between sleeping and working and uh, sleeping and waking and working and sleeping and waking and working starts to work a kind of, um, uh, starts to, starts to dawn on one that one is not only living one's life of routine and work and aspiration and entrepreneurship, one actually has this uh, very real spiritual existence that one is living through, constantly changing, constantly growing, constantly growing wisdom, constantly seeing. And that, you know, that becomes really the, the rudder in the ocean. That becomes what I'm holding on to as all these other things happen or don't happen. Yeah, I have a picture, uh, just to build on that, just to, just imagine you are um, a sailor, and you're gonna, you've got this beautiful map, this 
beautifully drawn, very detailed. And you're going to go on a voyage. You're going to hit that ocean. It's a big, wide ocean. You're going to find the shore on the other side. So you hit your boat and you, you head out. Uh, the near shore, the shore you just left, is now out of sight. And you're out there in the ocean. You're like, okay, time to get my beautiful map. It'll tell me exactly what to do. You open it up and it's blank. There's nothing there. And you have to, what do you have, you know, to navigate across this ocean with? Well, you have your own capabilities because there ain't no map for where you need to go. And this is the thing about the supreme ordeal is that there are no maps out there. There are no templates. There are no menus. There are no how-tos. No one can tell you how to navigate your supreme ordeal. Only you can figure that out but that's the beauty of it because the setup is such that uh, you can figure it out and if you choose to and you will figure it out and in fact that's the gift that's the forging of the gift is so so w there you are you're a sailor you're, you're out in the ocean um, you can you don't have a map but you can read the stars you can uh, watch the clouds, you can smell the wind, you can look at the waves, you've got other organs with which you can navigate, but they're inner organs. And they are not given to you like your physical body is given to you. You have to forge them. And this is the secret of the supreme ordeal, mm -hmm. is it's a, it's, it's the crucible. It's the, uh, it's the initiation by fire, and it's painful, uh, but it's it's necessary. Forging organs of perception, you're forging medicine. They're the same thing. There's sort of pictures of the same thing. Um, and in Jeff's and my work, uh, we need those organs of perception in the work that we do. When we go into a different country and a different culture, and we work with people who are trying to uh, heal violence in their country. And we're process guys for them. Um, we we have to be able to see into invisible fields, fields of relationship, of wound, of gift, of capacity, um, and we have to do it with uh, you know the eyes can't do that, but the soul can do that. And so this has been our particular priority. These are not the kinds of skills that are prioritized in our world. And this is part of my supreme ordeal has been that, that you know, people call them soft skills or whatever they call it, right? Um, they're not considered important. What's considered important is your professional expertise or your uh, PhD or your training in this and, or that in, in 20 years of experience, you know, Whatever it is, the kind, these organs of perception, these soul gifts, these soul qualities, the world doesn't. It's almost you could almost say, and I and I'm and I'm soft on this. I'm happy for you guys to disagree. They're like feminine with a capital F. The 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 the, the skills that have been deprioritized because we are in a in a, in a world of patriarchy and not. Uh, do you see what I'm saying? So these the sort of the feminine. Uh, quality of organs of perception, of seeing the whole, of um, embracing with love uh, and, and listening empathically, these kinds of skills navigating through a great deal of social complexity with a great deal of openness um, and, and listening, uh, this is exactly what we need and it's what we don't prioritize, especially in peace building work. I'm really glad to hear you talk about about you, some of the process. Mm -hmm. I think one thing that comes up and, and has come up for me off and on is uh, sort of prioritizing myself, giving myself the time. Or even as you said when we were doing the, the, the creativity workshop down in L.A., uh, when you were speaking to that one woman, it, was, it doesn't matter if it's one minute a day, right? At least to start. Yeah. To get into some type of rhythm, to begin to give yourself that gift of time for, for me. Yeah, sometimes you you only remember about meditating after you've forgotten and you're like, oh, I'll do better tomorrow. 
So the practice is just remembering to do it. And then eventually you remember, and, you, and, and then the practice is about doing it, right? So, I mean, Jeff and I meditate for a long time in the morning. Um, but we didn't start that way. Obviously, we and and it's a particular priority for us because of the work that we do. I, mean, I think it could be a priority for anyone, but um, I mean, I started it with five minutes a day, if I remembered, right? That's how I started. It took me a long time to to build it into my life. So it's okay if you if you don't remember, but just keep trying. Mm-hmm. It's the trying that matters. The one thing that jumped out at me was that though I've been fairly consistent. Throughout my life, you know, there have been oases and there have been desert years. Mm. Um, and there have been long, flowing fields uh, of, of practice. Um, but, uh, but how it would be like, the one thing that has just shifted for me was that there was, it was always a matter of finding the time to do it. Right, right, right. And that has been the big shift that's come to me so far this, you know, fairly recently in the last really, I don't know, in the last year in some ways, it's been growing and really solidified in the last few months of not finding the time. Because when I have to find the time, there are times when I won't do it. Right. But if I don't have to find the time, then I can always do it. (laughs) Right. Well, that reminds me of, see, I I mentioned thinking, so concentration being a thinking meditation. I mentioned uh, feeling meditation like peace. But there's also the will. So the will needs training as well. You can refine your, your concentration and your thinking. And there's all kinds of meditations and contemplative meditations that, that uh, focus on that. And you can refine and, and create organs of perception out of your feeling life. But the will and, and, and how you get into action, you know, actually waking up six minutes earlier, um, Getting into the rhythm, we have a saying, uh, rhythm replaces strength. That's directly from Steiner. Um, it's true. <laughs> it, it's really like that. The will is uh, is something that we can deliberately cultivate and calibra- deliberately support. Rudolf Steiner gives a lot of exercises um, for all kinds of uh, organs of perception and capacities. The, the will exercise... Is, is one that will also feature in World Maker. It's the, um, which I used to do a lot and I still do from time to time. It's the exercise of doing a meaningless activity for a period of time every day at the same time. And the meaningless part is, is making sure that it's not tied to any output, any goal, any other reason other than doing the exercise. So, for example, when I was young, I would stand on a chair for five minutes every day. Um, but my mentor, one of my mentors, would uh, at the same time every day take a handkerchief out of his left pocket and put it in his right pocket, which he could, which he found himself able to do. For example, when he was teaching a class or whatever. Oh, cool. um, so, these exercises, you can actually get to where you know my will exercise used to happen at two thirty, and if I did it enough. And if you, when you start, you forget, you, you forget, you forget, you forget. But when you remember, you do it then. And you, if, then you forget the next day and you remember at four o'clock, but then you do it then. And then suddenly you will find yourself looking for a chair to stand on at 2.30. Now, I had to change my will exercise because I got good at it. And I would find myself in a meeting at 2.30 and I couldn't stand on a chair. At least I did. And people wondered what I was doing. And I was young enough and brazen enough to say, I'm doing my will exercise. And I still hear about that 20 years later. <laughs> you know, this guy used to do this thing. But um, now I would just cross my fingers at 2.30. Mm. Right? The other thing that's really been a, just is unbeatable in terms of developing the will is physical work. Mm. And by that, I mean, you know, building a compost pile, fixing a fence, fixing the broken door, getting handy with some tools, doing physical work where you are pitted against the solid material of physical reality and you have to work within its laws. And especially if the work involves repetitive things like sanding or or painting or grinding or you know 
the, the, the body working repetitive motion to accomplish a physical task, you're, you're not only bu- building your muscles, you're building the strength of your will. Mm-hmm. And I have found physical work to be this great willpower builder. And I think so many young people struggle with their will because they don't look at physical, they don't value physical work. Mm-hmm. And this yeah. includes dishes. And this include washing diapers. Yeah, and absolutely. Cleaning the house. And, absolutely, because uh, we have a funny definitely. story about that in our own yeah. household of, yeah. of um, you know, not having a strong will when we were young, and having babies and realizing that we had to do that physical work, and doing it then over decades built the will to where now dishes are no problem, lawn needs mowing, no problem, something needs fixing, get it done. There's no procrastination. It goes on the schedule. It gets done. And we look at ourselves and say, wow, do you remember how hard that was <laughs> yes. you know, 20 years ago yeah. when we started out? And now it's just like, no problem. Actually, I think that we're better with our will than we believe we are. Because there are things that we commit to doing unconsciously. And some of that is maintaining our old family patterns, our cultural patterns, oh. our personal patterns. <laughs> yeah. And those things... We commit to and our will to keep ourselves in our mm-hmm. ruts mm-hmm. or our patterns is so strong. Yeah, but I wonder if we could really call that our will. I would say that you know, but it, but but you're not free. You're not that. free. No. But it is, and it, you're right, it, it's not that it's necessarily our will, but it is a will that works within us. And that's for sure. But, but and do you to, call compulsion will? No, that's different. I don't believe that it's compulsion. But it is a kind of will that is working in us. I think that's well said. And it could be. But I yeah. think that if we actually become to see how the we there's so many there's so much that we actually accomplish through will act through yeah. through from the will energy. The question not is thinking, how to then divert that unconscious and some of it uncreative will yeah. into conscious creative work. And I think what you're talking about is these exercises are that but I just because you said these kids are saying how do I yeah. how do I, uh, develop, how do I the will. develop the yeah. will and it's yeah. actually I, th- I think part of that is a slight reframing of this thing that so many of us have right which is when we struggle with something is we say ah oh, like I need to do better uh, yeah. at this when you know I, I, I have a really hard time committing to something and follow, following through with it when it's actually not the case you're very good at doing that yeah. just not necessarily the things that you find that are that that are actually helpful or valuable yeah well uh, yes and the 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 building of the organ of will uh, the creative will unfortunately is painful i know from personal experience it's just a painful process but it's necessary 